Thanks, Corey. I'd like to thank the Lake Superior Technical Committee as well as the Fisheries Commission for allowing me to come back this year and give you an update on our work in, on contaminants in Lake Superior fish. I'd like to thank Bill Mattis in particular for many years of fruitful collaboration on, on contaminants in fish. <clears throat> My starting point last year was this very map, which shows this huge spatial variation in concentrations of one particular contaminant, PCBs, in lake trout in Lake Superior. Turns out the same spatial pattern is shown by every other contaminant we've looked at, with the exception of the PFAS compounds. So it's not something unique to this compound class. And obviously this has implications for human health risk, if nothing else. Um, but it also has implications for the ecology of the lake, for the magnitude of, and distribution of processes occurring throughout Lake Superior. Because these contaminants have one thing in common. They're coming into the lake from the atmosphere. They're coming uniformly over the lake surface area. So it has to be processes within the lake itself that are causing this um, accumulation in particular areas within the lake. And so if we can understand this, the thought is we can understand some of those processes and what drives those processes to differ from one area of the lake to another. <clears throat> the possible explanations for this are that it's simply an artifact of the measurement. It's very expensive to measure contaminants in fish, and as a result, we don't measure hundreds of fish. We generally collect a handful of samples, five to 10 in any given area. And that may be inadequate to characterize the spatial variability. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, this is not likely to be coming from spatial variation in inputs of the contaminants itself. And so we won't talk about that further. <clears throat> But rather, the spatial variability is likely to reflect differences in ecosystem processes, such as food chain length, such as resource availability, and ultimately to higher level ecosystem processes, such as trophic transfer efficiencies, which I won't speak about today. So our approach here was to first try to verify that the spatial patterns that we observed are in fact real by assembling all the measurements that we could find and making additional measurements. Um, so we gathered all the agency data available that was collected in a, in a similar fashion. We used Glyphwick's mercury analyses and we made additional measurements ourselves <clears throat> concentrating on the two sides of the Keweenaw Peninsula because, as shown in this map, <clears throat> concentrations are hugely different on the west side of the peninsula in the MI3 management unit than they are on the east side of the peninsula in the MI4 management unit. <clears throat> So when we assemble those measurements, we do find that, yes, that pattern seems to hold up. This map is, is created differently than the previous one. Here the colors are, oops, <clears throat> the colors are indicating the contaminant magnitude. So hotter colors are indicating higher concentrations, cooler colors, low concentrations. The size of the symbol reflects the size of the fish, <clears throat> and the different symbols represent the different sources of the data. So putting all that together, there still does seem to be a preponderance of high concentrations shown by the red symbols on the west side of the Keweenaw Peninsula in the lake and lower concentrations, particularly along the south shore through Michigan, as well as in Minnesota and Wisconsin. 
So we looked carefully at, at Glyphwick's data because here we had more samples collected in the same area and we could be sure that this pattern was real, that it wasn't failure to collect a size spectrum of fish and adequately account for the changes that are induced by fish growth and fish aging. We also measured additional fish and in both cases we see the expected pattern of increasing contaminants with increasing fish size, the typical bioaccumulation pattern that we expect, and there are significant differences, the western side of the peninsula being higher. And that holds for concentrations at, at low fish sizes as well as concentrations at high fish sizes. So I mentioned this would appear to have implications for human health, but when we actually put those into fish consumption guidelines using Glyphwick's protocols for doing that, we find that in fact there aren't differences in what would be recommended daily consumption allowances on, on both sides of the peninsula. In this graphic, we've shown that one can calculate those consumption guidelines based on individual contaminants. And typically what we do is we assign the contaminant with the most restrictive guideline to be the one in force for any particular area. And you'll see that those are pretty similar on both sides of the peninsula. It is nevertheless significant that 40 years after PCBs were banned, we still have consumption recommendations of only one or two fish a month in this area of Lake Superior. So there still is need for management actions to reduce inputs of PCBs to the Great Lakes. <clears throat> So let's turn to the ecosystem processes and ask, do these differences result from different food web structure on the two sides of the peninsula? And there we might look at whether the food chain lengths on the two sides are different or whether the food chain composition results in differential intake of contaminants on the two sides such as eating of more benthic-derived <clears throat> um, food would be likely to result in greater bioaccumulation in fish. So what we looked at was N15 for trophic positions, um, carbon-13 for food web sources, and then also the diet composition. When we look at the stable isotopes, the N15 really doesn't suggest that food web lengths are different on the two sides. The N15 values are not significantly different in MI3 versus MI4 in either of these fish species that are shown here, which include lean lake trout, whitefish, and ciscos. Um, the C13, on the other hand, does show that there is a consistent broader niche on the eastern side of the peninsula in MI4 than there is in MI3. This can be seen in both of these graphs um, by the wider error bars or the wider ellipses for the green symbols than the red. So there is evidence that there's a greater diversity of food eaten on the eastern side of the peninsula. Um, and that raises a couple of possibilities. Again, that there might be more benthic derived food, but because C13 isn't systematically higher on one side than the other, we don't think that's the case. Rather, there just seems to be a greater diversity of food eaten on one side than the other. We will need to examine those um, lower trophic level food sources to see if that's the origin of the difference in contaminant concentrations. 
Looking for diet analysis, we turn to the recent study um, of the CSMI data done by the Ariel Edwards for her master's thesis, and she does show differences in lean lake trout diets on the two sides of the peninsula. So in MI4, the lean lake trout appear to eat more mysis, more smelt and herring, and in MI3, they appear to eat more small fish that are so well digested they can't be identified, as well as more benthic invertebrates. We could further ask, do, is there, are there differences in resource availability? Because if there were, then fish might be growing faster on, on one side of the peninsula than the other, and that growth dilution could cause decreased concentrations of contaminants where resources are in highest abundance. So we examine lipid content and condition factor, and we examine growth rates um, in order to examine that hypothesis. Lipid content really showed no difference on either side of the peninsula. Condition factor does show a slight and significant difference, but it's not a huge difference by any stretch, but it does suggest that perhaps resources are more abundant or more energy rich on the eastern side of the peninsula. Looking at growth rates, we do see that Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button here. Um, here we have the growth at length in 1985. Here we have more recent conditions. There does seem to have been a change over time in growth conditions exhibited by these lake trout populations. Growth rates were slower, um, but were sustained leading to higher total lengths of fish at similar age. Here we had rapid initial growth rates, um, but lower maximum lengths of fish. Uh, and in this graph, there's no great difference between the curves on, for fish on both sides of the peninsula. We can break that down into shorter increments of time, and there, there are slight differences in that initial growth rate in, the time, in this period where we don't have data, where we extrapolate that based on our growth model that suggests that the one side of the peninsula changed more rapidly than the other, but we don't have direct measurements of that other than the model fit. So what we can conclude to date is that, yes, the spatial variation does appeal, appear to be real. There are higher concentrations in lake trout relatively closely proximal to one another. The trophic position of those lake trout doesn't appear to be different. The diets do show some differences. There does appear to be some evidence of higher resource availability on one side than the other, and that may contribute to the difference in contaminant concentrations. But I'm afraid we've got additional work to do yet to fully clarify this. We need to determine if those different growth rates um, are sufficient to cause the different bioaccumulations. We can do that through bioenergetic bioaccumulation modeling. Um, we can thereby determine if the growth rates and condition factors are both explained by um, or are both related to con differences in contaminant concentrations. We can determine if the um, Ultimately, if, if warranted, we could look further to determine if this spatial pattern does have implications for the entire food web and result in a higher efficiency of conversion of energy to 
to upper trophic levels. But at this point, that'll await future work. So with that, I, I leave you with that still incomplete story, but with I'd like to acknowledge the help we've gotten on this project from my co-authors, all of our students, um, Glyphwick and KBIC for collecting data and um, the other sources of support we've had. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions.